Uh, we'll start with the Army.
Paula. I'm the head trainer for Patriot Assistance Dogs. We've been around since 2011, and I'm into my 11th year, but I forgot. Um, <laughs> and we'll be here for a little bit. I can answer all kinds of questions, but we provide service dogs to our veteran at no cost. So it makes a difference. It's different for each of our veterans, but 70 to 80 percent of our dogs are rescue dogs as well. So we promise both the dog and a veteran a life of dignity and respect, and we see this magic piece of part of the wellness. They're not the only answer, but we see the magic of two rescued rescue dog and a veteran that become one service dog team unit and it's pretty amazing. And I would like you to hear from two of our veterans here with me tonight and I will let them introduce, they have some things to share with you. So thank you very much. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to say uh, thank you to the Lions Club for uh, that awesome deal. Thank you all the volunteers. Um, to our Korea veteran, uh, I am humbled to be in your presence. Thank you very much for your service. Uh, our Vietnam veterans, welcome home. And um, I want to recognize uh, some people that are extremely, extremely important uh, to me and to most of you. If you are a spouse or a caregiver to a veteran, can you please stand up? From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for your service and your sacrifice, your unconditional love, because without you, it would be impossible to go on, so thank you. Uh, this is my service dog, Cal. I've had him for uh, two and a half years. Um, I'm an eight-year Marine combat veteran. Uh, I, was in, uh, I joined the Marine Corps in 2002, right after 9-11. And I did three deployments to Iraq. In uh, 2006, on my third deployment, um, it was very tough. Um, I was on a vehicle patrol. Uh, on May 23rd, 2006, and we turned left down this road, a road that we have been down hundreds of times. But that particular time, we, went, we turned down that road, and I knew something was wrong. So I was reaching for my radio to call, I'll stop, and the vehicle in front of me exploded. And I had six Marines in that vehicle. And I was, I was a platoon sergeant, I was in charge of them, so I felt uh, responsible. And when I came home, I didn't have any tools to uh, cope with that, so um, I started drinking, I started drinking heavily. And um, I did that for 15 years. And pretty soon, uh, alcohol wasn't enough. I started having nightmares. Um, and my nightmares were very vivid. They were very real. I could, uh, I could smell cordite. I could smell diesel fuel. That's how real they were. And I was having them every single night. So I'm a war fighter. There's not much that I'm afraid of. But I'm telling you right now, I was terrified to go to sleep at night. And um, so me being a Marine, I thought, OK, I just won't go to sleep. So I started doing drugs, and that's um, amphetamines, and I would stay awake for three or four days straight. That way, I wouldn't have any nightmares, and as soon as my head hit the pillow, I would be out. And I would sleep for 24 hours, I would get up and do it all over again. And your body can only take that for so long before it says enough is enough. And um, I attempted suicide, and uh, what saved me that night is I didn't want my seven-year-old son to find me dead in my kitchen. 
So I went to the VA, and that started my very long, hard road to recovery. Um, and I'm here to tell you that I'm four years sober, and I got up this morning with a smile on my face, ready to embrace the day, and it's because of programs like Patriot Assistance Dogs that gave me my life back. Cal is, he means the world to me. He allows me to go out in public and, and be a functioning member of society. And before, I didn't have that for the longest time. I didn't smile for 15 years. For 15 years, I lost my smile. And Patriot Assistance Dogs helped me get that back. And um, I'm extremely grateful to this program. Now I serve on the Board of Directors uh, because I want every veteran to have what I have. I want every veteran to wake up every morning ready to embrace the day. So, um, like Paula said, we'll be here. Uh, we can answer any questions that you would like. And I thank you for being here. And I want to introduce you to Tony and Captain Kirk. Thank you very much for having us here today. Uh, it really means a lot. And thank you all to the veterans and, and the spouses. I, I'm really glad you called that out, Phil, because that's, um, you, you ask every service member, why do we do what we do? Family, God, country. Um, and and that's, that's what it's all about. Um, mine's a little bit different. Um, I, I, I call it a story about hospitals and airplanes. Um, I was in the Air Force. I was never deployed to a combat zone. Um, I worked in communications and intelligence, so they didn't let us out of the dark rooms very often. Um, I, I spent three years overseas in northern Japan, a little place called Misawa. Uh, my wife and I absolutely fell in love with it. It's, it's the gorgeous country. If you ever get the chance to go, go and go as far north as you can possibly go. Because the further you get away from Tokyo, the more real Japan it becomes. There's no English, there's no written or spoken, so you really get a chance to go back in. So we spent three years in Japan, and um, after that I came back to Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane, Washington, with my, my daughter and my wife. And um, Spokane, Fairchild was at the time, it was a nuclear base. And if anybody's ever been on a nuclear installation, you know it's damn near impossible to get on and, and very, very, very well protected. So me raising a family on, on, on a fair child, that I, I, I couldn't have been in a better place. I grew up in a really ugly place, so I had no trust issues. Um, um, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's, I could sleep at night. Um, um, sorry, he's learning, I'm learning. Um, but we are scheduled to perform a class next December, so this December, so it's, it's a it's a wonderful progress. Um, June 20th, 1994, in Spokane. June's a beautiful place to be in Spokane. The, the skies are blue, the water's clear, um, you know, the boating's open up, fishing, things like that. It's, it's very much like Western Minnesota here. Um, it was a Monday, and uh, we were all doing what we do, running around, taking care of the equipment like we normally would. We were recalled back to our units. We got back to the unit, and they immediately ID us. Now, Overseas, that was not an uncommon experience, but to have it done on a stateside base in your shop on a nuclear base, you knew something was really wrong. So we got in, we found out that um, there was an active shooter on a base. And um, everybody would look, why would you do something like that? There's only one outcome. Fairchild had more police and security forces than Spokane City and County. Why would they do something like that? 
the extent suicide, which it, it was, but um, they didn't shoot up the base. They shot up the hospital. So my house was right across the street, and uh, my wife was a witness to it. We had to watch it play up. But he, um, five people dead, six if you count the unborn child, and 22 wounded. And it really shattered, just the base was never the same again. Um, and, and to this day, I can't, I, I, I sweat just thinking about flying. I, I have real anxiety attacks in airplanes. Um, anything over four hours, and I just, I won't go, I won't do it. I can't. Um, and that, you know, and, and, and so hospitals for me, they're not a place of healing anymore. They're, they're, because you go back and you can see where they replaced the carpet, old carpet, the new carpet. Why did they do that? You can see where they patched the bullet holes. Why did they do that? Um, Dean Melberg, his name, he saw it. He fired 73 shots in his tirade. And they were all one psychiatrist, one psychologist, two civilians, and one sergeant. Um, it all came to a switching hall. Um, for those of you that appreciate handguns, um, a security force stopped him with a 70-yard pistol shot. It was it was quite a quite a feat, and that was devastating. I mean, it just tore the base up. Um, I, we had funeral ceremonies, and I watched the honor guard just break down. I've never seen that. So we're starting to heal, get back to you know back to what we were. And fortunately, we had a, a an air show scheduled for Saturday. And, and on the Air Force Base air shows, it's a time of celebration on the base and with the community both. We open our doors, we open our arms, and we we're really looking forward to it. It was a Saturday. So the Friday before, and I loved airplanes, I wanted to work on them. But in the Air Force's infinite wisdom, they said, no, you got bad hearing. I said, what? <laughs> we don't want to damage your hearing. And I said, yeah, I heard you. That wasn't a... You know, you're not going to do anything that's not already there. Come on. I, I got stuck, stuck in calm. I, I wonder if it's airplanes. I loved airplanes. Um, they, they, they were fascinating machines. So we're all looking forward to this air show. And Friday before, like I said, if you ever been there, you know, Friday before, they're landing, they're coming in, they're taxiing. And occasionally you'll see a few practicing. And they were doing that. And they had a thing. And at the time, it was... Um, You've heard of the uh, Thunderbirds. Well, there was a strategic air command general that wanted his Thunderbirds. They called them the Thunderhawks. And they decided to make B-52s do the same thing the F-16s were doing. One road would put a bird in the hangar for six weeks to get flight ready again. Um, they, they really pushed it beyond the limits. I had my daughter around on the pad watching them, they'd open up the gates so that the service members, you know, the Air Force, would, that we'd go out there on the pad where they parked the airplanes, and we could watch them, they're flying right by, it was just great, it was beautiful. And if you, there's a video out on the internet if you want to see it, but um, in the practice, there were two planes, KC-135 tanker and a B-52, and they were doing this stupid routine called low level flight refueling. Well, there's no such thing, okay? Because when they're refueling, I mean, they're going up and down all the time, okay? So it's just not something they do. But the only reason they were doing it was to show off to for this general so he could get his kudos and, and say, you know, look, I got, I got my own over here. You got the thunders, I got the thunder box. You know, we got eight inches, you got one. How you like me now? Well, on that day, um, The tanker and the bomber were flying across the runway at very low level. The tanker split off to the right. The bomber tried to split off to the left, and he caught dirty, he was dirty air. Um, what happened next is um, the airplane banked. He tried to turn. He had. He didn't have enough airspeed. 
um, and he laid it down. Um, and I knew two of the people on that plane, and there was nothing bigger than 10 feet left. It was just one up in a fireball. And that, that devastated me. Because I, there was no place ever going to be safe again. I vowed right there that I would never, ever live on the base again because I can't put my family at risk. I had my daughter in my arms. If he had flown another 100 yards, 150 yards, he would have hit a nuclear dump. He would have hit a nuclear storage facility. But he laid it down before him. And I don't know if that was by accident, by chance, or by choice. I don't think really. They have put the voice recorder out for reading, but I can't do it. Um, but there is a video out there, um, and it's just one of the most stupidest, senseless weeks that I just, I don't understand it. Um, today, and two years later, my career ended, I broke my back, and unfortunately, with a broken back, I go to the hospital a lot, and, and that is just an anxiety. I don't fly. But now that I have Captain Kirk, it's, it's, it's easier. The anxiety attacks don't come so hard at the hospital. I had cancer surgery at the beginning of the year, and um, it was a different experience with the service dog. Um, he, uh, he couldn't stay the night. So when he came back the next day, he never talked to you. I mean, that's nice job, I was a hero. But he was having no part of healing. He had to come and find me. And he knew where to go. And he came and found me. And hopefully I can, we can, we can fly. Again, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, when that bird went down the air, the, the, air, the engines made a noise that still gives me nightmares and terrors to this day. Because, it was so loud and the engine started screaming and then the people started screaming. And um, those are my nightmares. And he, um, he helps me a lot. He, um, at first, he just jump on me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now we're down to a gentle touch. He doesn't have to take the wind out of me to get my attention, but you know, I, I don't know. He's, And, and I'm really looking forward to the things that we can do, as I, as I told you. Uh, these, these service animals, they give us an opportunity to stand up here and say, you know, there's other methods. So if you know a veteran, I mean, this is why we're here. If you know a veteran, let's help. You know, um, because Drinking doesn't do it. Drugs doesn't do it. There, there's just nothing. You know, I've tried for 30 plus years. I just discovered major assistance dogs three and a half years ago. And it's, my world is a thousand times better. And it's another thousand times better when I see veterans get their lives back. So, um, you know, the, come and see us for just right down the road in Detroit Lakes with a big white sign right out front. Give you a tour of the facility and show you what we're There'll be a class the first week of December. Stop by and you can see some of the veterans and, and, and some of the magic calling stuff. So, thank you.